achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. And on this episode of the show, we're breaking down the upcoming January 15th UFC Fight Night 35 event, which will take place, as I said, on January 15th in Duluth, from Duluth, Georgia. Six main card fights, which I will break down for you all on this episode. Six preliminary fights, which I will break down at kamikazeoverdrive.net. And I encourage you to go to that website as I am expanding my number of predictors. Of course, I have the kamikaze kid, Josh Harper, breaking down fights for your left, right, and center, and still doing a wonderful job. I've also added a number of predictors who will be uh, enhancing and expanding the panel, so please check out their work as they're doing a very good job as well. My bet packs will be on sale for this event, $10. Uh, please consider investing, and I'm giving you as much betting advice as I possibly can. I had some success at the last show, not as much as I was hoping for, but it was a very tough show to break down considering the, n the number of new debuting fighters with limited footage available. I went 6-4 and four overall, disappointed with the main event. I thought Lim did okay. He wasn't as aggressive as I was hoping he was being as a result. Safadine was able to take the win in that fight, uh, winning most likely rounds 2, 3, and 4. I thought the first round was close with Lim you know, coming up just a little bit short, possibly taking it. He clearly won the last round with his aggression and nearly had Safadine in trouble uh, finishing that fight. Uh, nonetheless, it's time to get into my six main card predictions. Our first of six main card predictions takes place in the UFC's featherweight division is Cole McGreenho Miller, 28 no battles, Sam Cecilia, 12, 3, and 0. Oh. Now coming into this fight, Miller, as he most, you know, normally does at featherweight has a significant physical advantages uh, five inches of height and six inches of reach which he'll need to exploit in this fight for the most part we have Miller's grappling against Sam Cecilia's striking power and that's going to be the deciding factor as to who gets to uh, fight the most of this fight in their area of expertise now Miller's a BJJ black belt 14 of his 20 wins have come by submission he doesn't have great wrestling numbers as I've talked about several times on my show averaging 0 0.52 takedowns at 29 percent now he has gone two for seven on takedowns over his last five fights since moving down to featherweight but he realized heavily in his opponents for, to take the fight in the mat, including getting put down eight times in those last five fights as well. Now, he's very good on the ground. He showed aggressive grappling versus Andy Ogle and Manny Gambarian getting in on the, in those fights. I felt he won the Gambarian fight. But again, he needed those opponents to take those fights in the mat, and then he showed good sweeps and reversals attack them from those positions. Cecilia, on the other hand, 67% takedown defense. So he's got good defensive work, but he was taken down by both Maximo Blanco and uh, Hani Jason in those fights, which cost him, I think, the, the, out, you know, the outcome of both matchups. Um, he has been submitted just one time in 15 fights, and for the most part, he needs to maintain separation and avoid making mistakes like Bart, Bart Palaszewski did against Miller, which set up Miller for a quick submission win. Uh, Cecilia has seven wins by knockout in his career, two in the UFC. We took out, we saw him take out... Uh, Godofredo Pepe from top position with some big strikes, which is something that Miller needs to be very wary of. Uh, Cecilia's striking, he's, it's improving, but he is, his technique anyway, but he struggled with the power of Maximo Blanco and Honey Jason in both of those matchups, got hurt in both of them, but he can crack when he wants to. Uh, both guys have solid output numbers. Um, 3.17 strikes landed for uh, Miller versus 3.22 in favor of Cecilia. Cecilia. Cecilia with a slight edge, but it's so minimal, it really probably won't show up that much. Both get hit at a, high, at a high rate as well, right around four strikes absorbed per minute, which isn't a good thing, especially for Miller with Cecilia's power. Uh, Cole did tag Andy Ogle with a very solid right hand, and we saw him drop uh, Ross Pearson ages ago back at lightweight uh, with a nice counter strike eventually led to the submission win. He works the clinch well uh, as well. You know, effectively as well with his height advantage, he should be able to do that. Now, Nam Fan had a lot of success getting in and landing some big shots against the guy who had a good reach in Miller. And he has been knocked out twice by Efrain Escudero and Jeremy Stevens. And those two guys can hit hard, and of course they're also lightweights. Keep that in mind as well. Miller has been improving using his reach. He didn't do a very good job in his earlier career, but he's doing it better now. Uh, he's had trouble. Uh, he, he, he still has a little bit of trouble keeping his opponents backed off, and that's where Cecilia's power will come into play here. He needs to keep them backpedaling and not walking in and landing big shots. Um, I think... The, the dividends of Cecilia's power will show up big in this fight if he can land with regularity, especially if Miller starts to slow down. We saw him fade against Andy Ogle and against Manny Gambirian. I think that could be the impact of 145, and overall he's 3-6 and six in fights that go to decision. But the thing is, Sam Cecilia doesn't have a great gas tank either and isn't known for exploiting guys late in fights. Cecilia was making a lot of mistakes versus uh, Maximo Blanco, being over-aggressive on the feet, which led to the grappling, allowed Blanco to get fights to the mat, and Miller is just not the type of guy you want to go to the ground with, especially when he has such a length, re uh, length advantage. On you. Miller, I think, will have some success in this fight on the on the mat, and I think he'll keep Cecilia out of range with, an impro with his improved use of reach, and I think he'll actually catch uh, Sam Cecilia. So my prediction is Cole Miller to defeat Sam Cecilia by submission. In the UFC's flyweight division, number four ranked 
13 2 0 John Moranga and for, former title challenger will battle number 15 ranked Dustin Ortiz 12 2 0. And I'm very happy the UFC's opted to expand their ranking systems. And uh, that gives you know a better understanding of where guys sit in the division. I wouldn't even mind seeing a top 20. I think it'd be very interesting. Now, Moraga's coming off a title loss, which will either wreck his career or help him to get to that next level as he was thoroughly outclassed by Demetrius Johnson. For uh, Dustin Ortiz, he rallied in a debut fight after a very close start against uh, Jose Maria, which fight was in Brazil and it was debut. So it's a good experience for Ortiz and really shows how tough this guy is. Is. Now, Maria did take him down a couple of times early in that fight, fight, but Ortiz showed some good composure and eventually got back to his feet, turned the tables and used his wrestling to take Maria down. He showed a good level change on his takedowns, went 4 for 7 overall in the fight, but Maria went 2 for 6 and had some success early on in that matchup as well. For me, Ortiz needs to be able to use his wrestling uh, to be a complete fighter and to be more effective in his fights, and in that matchup he's able to use it. It'll be a big question mark whether he can get it off against Moraga here. Now, he was getting cracked with some wild shots from Maria in that matchup, which is certainly a concern against a guy like Moraga who can throw some, some uh, hot leather. Now, he did also get caught in a couple of guillotine attempts, and Moraga, again, is very capable of submitting guys if you give him the opportunity. Moraga is an NCAA Division I wrestler, but really hasn't shown his wrestling so far in the UFC, averaging 1.16 takedowns at 43%. He did go 2 for 2 against a solid veteran, Chris Cariasso, and he landed one takedown against Demetrius Johnson on five attempts, which is impressive despite the fact that it's just a single takedown. And as you know, Johnson's next to impossible to take down. Uh, 32% takedown defense, which not, that number has been impacted significantly since the Johnson fight. Cariasso won for two. Ulysses Gomez is a good grappler in his own right, went 0 for 5, but Johnson went a perfect 12 for 12 and really drastically changed that number. Now, Moraga does have six wins by submission, while Ortiz has four. Uh, and for me, who, what it comes down to is whoever can win the ground battle will hold a big edge in this fight. And I'm leaning towards Moraga with his top level wrestling background. On the feet, Ortiz was landing some decent shots versus Jose Maria, but he doesn't throw anything overly flashy. He does have five wins by knockout, but he struggled with the striking of Ian McCall and wasn't nearly as effective because he couldn't mix in his wrestling. He was the second best wrestler in that matchup and that cost him. Uh, Moraga has just two wins by knockout, but we did see him stop Gomez with some brutal elbows along the cage, and, show, and he showed improvement with his hands. He will counter strike and was waiting a bit too much uh, against Chris Cariasso, letting Cariasso get off first, and that's something that can get you behind in the cards pretty quickly. His two career losses have come against Demetrius Johnson and John Dodson outside of the UFC, arguably two of the fastest fighters in the company, and that's something to keep in mind here. For me, Moraga should have either a speed advantage or at the very least be equal in speed with, with Ortiz, and so he won't have the issues he had against Dodson or Johnson. I think this is going to be a closer fight than the rankings, at least would indicate 15, or 15 versus number four. I know they're still in their infant stage. Nonetheless, I think Moraga's wrestling shows up big here, and both defensively and offensively offensively allowing him to land takedowns if he wants, defend takedowns that he will need to defend when Ortiz looks taken to the mat, and set up his striking. My prediction is John Moraga to defeat Dustin Ortiz by decision. In the UFC's middleweight division, a pair of former Strike Force fighters go head-to-head -head as Yoel, Soldier of God, Romero, 6-1-0, battles Derek Brunson, 11-2-0. This is a battle of wrestlers. This is Brunson's an NCAA Division II wrestler against Romero, who was a Olympic silver medalist uh, freestyle wrestler back in the day. Statistically, Brunson, 2.65 takedowns at 45%, 100% takedown defense. He had to be taken off his feet uh, in the grappling department. He landed four takedowns against Chris Lieben in his UFC debut. Also, five versus Nate James early in his strike force career. He has a pretty smothering top game, but he does have four wins by submission if he can get the fight to the mat. Uh, Romero, on the other hand, his stats have not... Uh, reflected his wrestling pedigree. 0 for 8 in his strike force career uh, and UFC career. 0 for 6 versus Rafael Fasia, which is the big number, who's hard to take down his own. And that was at light heavyweight, keep in mind as well. 73% takedown defense, which he can be taken down. Marks went 2 for 6 in his career, uh, in his fight against uh, Romero. But that's actually impressive considering how good Rahani Marks has been with his grappling. Um, Marks had scored 10 takedowns in his first three fights and dominated good wrestlers with his ground game, and Romero was able to pretty much neutralize it despite those two takedowns. When he did get taken out, he got up very quickly, and as he's a very good wrestler. He's still adapting to MMA only seven fights into his uh, strike force career, so that, or his UFC fighting career, professional career, so he's still learning the fighting game. Uh, Again, a battle of grapplers like this and wrestlers, it can often lead to a striking-based contest. Now, Brunson, he caught Brian Houston his last fight quick with a head kick, which led to a submission finish, which shows some significant improving improvement in his grappling game. He has four wins by knockout, uh, but we saw him get KO'd by Jacare Souza fairly quickly, and Jacare at the time was still a fairly green striker. Um, Bronson, for the most part, is still working on his striking skills. He will have a five-inch reach advantage, which he needs to exploit here. Um, but his striking defense is a major question mark. He still hands, tends to hold his chin up a little bit, and his hands will drop as he gets tired. 
it's you know he probably would have got knocked out by Chris Lieben if Lieben was you know still in his prime and not exhausted in the shell of his former self when they met. Romero, his younger brother is the IBF cruiserweight boxing champion, and so that tells me right there he's probably working with him and learning some things. It's going to show some improvement in his striking. Uh, Romero, when he strikes, he has very lively body motion, constantly moving, changes changes pace well, uh, moves very slow and then explodes, which can be very hard to defend against. He shows his opponents a lot of angles and looks, constantly moving forward, good head movement as well. As well. We saw that against uh, Marks to avoid getting tagged with some big shots. And he was landing some quality strikes in that fight. And uh, we did see Marks uh, land his own good shots, but for the most part, Romero outclassed him on the feet, dropped him with a brutal left hand. Uh, we saw him KO Clifford Starks in his debut with a jumping knee. He has six wins by knockout. All six of his fights have ended by knockout. One loss by KO to Rafael Fajal, which was 205, so he needs to be careful that Brunson doesn't tag him clean. Cardio is a major question mark for both guys, but Romero's performance against Marks which is a, was very impressive, and his movement shows that he's, he's learning how to conserve his energy and not, you know, you know, exhaust himself too quickly. Uh, for the most part, if either one of these guys connects and lands flush, the fight could end right there. But I think the movement of Romero will make it tough for Brunson to both connect and defend against, and I think he'll land a big shot. So my prediction is Yoel Romero to knock out Derek Brunson and take home the victory. Our fourth fight in the main card is a very difficult fight to predict as it features, it's featured in the UFC's Bantamweight division. Number six ranked TJ Dillashaw, 9-2-0, battles the number seven ranked Mike the Hulk Easton, 13-3-0. And I don't mean it's difficult just because of their rankings now close there. It's just stylistically, it's going to be a very tight matchup I can, that, as far as I can see. Easton is coming off his first two-fight losing streak of his career and a nine-month layoff. So he's had you know some tough times of late and he's been out of the cage for a little while. Dillashaw, on the other hand, four-fight winning streak in his last uh, was snapped in his last bout, but he nearly finished that fight early and lost a split decision. And he said in the media that loss has really fueled his fire and is pushing him to be better, and we'll see if that transpires here. Uh, both guys have recently fought Rafael Sunsau, and for the most part, I'd say Easton lost the more decisive fight where Dillashaw lost a very competitive split decision that he easily could have been given the nod in had it not maybe been in Brazil. I don't know. Now we have an NCAA Division I wrestler in Dillashaw who's very good, a very good grappler against a BJJ and Taekwondo black belt, so a very well-versed and decorated fighter in his own right in Mike Easton. Now Easton has very solid leg kicks, which comes with that Taekwondo background, decent hands, he likes to keep them tight and throw good, powerful combinations, and for the most part he likes to be the aggressor and really press forward and press the action. Now we saw Brad Pickett have some success in his victory over Easton when he pushed back and didn't let Easton bully him around, but again Pickett was wearing down in that fight from simply from the power and the big shots he was taking from Mike Easton because Easton can throw some heavy, heavy leather. Now Dillashaw has his own power and has improved his striking significantly since working with Bang Ludwig. Again, we've talked with the alpha male guys improving. I don't think it's being impro has improved as much as it's being lauded, but he still has looked better, uh, certainly has since Bang Ludwig has come along. For me, Dillashaw holds his lead hand a little bit low, but he likes to go higher with a head kick, which you know can catch guys off guard, especially if they're ba he's baiting him with that, le that low uh, lead hand. Uh, for me, in his last fight, Dillashaw wasn't throwing enough jabs to set up his strikes. I think he'll work on that. He was waiting on a sunset a little bit, and as I said, Easton likes to be the, aggra the aggressor, so Dillashaw wants to avoid uh, allowing Mike Easton to be the guy pushing the pace. Dillashaw, for me, he needs to be the actual guy pushing that pace and backing him down. Very close in total strikes landed. Uh, the output for both guys, but Dillashaw has a massive advantage in strikes absorbed per minute, and that's something he needs to keep Easton from landing with consistency while outpointing him. Easton has excellent takedown defense when we switch gears and look at the grappling. Uh, he wanted to use his grappling over against, against Brad Pickett, and he did that with some moderate success. He had trouble taking Pickett down, but he did land some takedowns, and I think he, went, he landed three in that matchup. For Dillashaw, he has a very solid shot. We saw against Rafael Asunza, who shut down Easton's grappling game. We saw Dillashaw have some success. He took him down, showed a good sprawl on Asunza's takedown defense, our takedown attempts, and we saw Dillashaw transition to a, a back uh, back control, which nearly led to a submission finish. Now TJ, he wasn't, he isn't as effective when he can't dominate with his wrestling, which he usually falls back on if the striking is not going his way. We saw him get tagged by Von Lee with a couple of shots, and against Hugo Vienna, he got hit with a couple of shots as well. He really needs a grappling edge or some success to be a confident fighter. Easton's takedown defense is solid, 80%, but he really hasn't faced a decent wrestler before he fought Brad Pickett, and I thought Pickett landing four takedowns that played a big role in that fight, and for me, Dillashaw is a better wrestler than Pickett is, Dill and coming out of a very good wrestling camp as well. Dillashaw has 100% takedown defense. He's landed 10 takedowns in his last five fights, averaging obviously two takedowns per fight. And as I said, he's the best wrestler Easton has faced to date. Dillashaw needs to be careful with taking that big shot. We saw him get KO'd by John Dodson. For me, Dillashaw's wrestling with a few takedowns and the ability to limit Easton's successful strikes will play a major role in this fight. This is going to be a close fight one way or another. And my prediction is TJ Dillashaw to defeat Mike Easton. I'll take it in close, most likely a split decision.
In the co-main event of the night, number 13 ranked middleweight, Lorenz the Monsoon Larkin, 14-1-0 with one no contest, battles Brad Tavares coming with a record of 11-2-0. Now both guys are striking base fighters predominantly. Larkin's a Muay Thai striker, eight wins by knockout. We saw him absolutely put a beating on Chris Camozzi and Robbie Lawler, but took those as decision wins, so he's won a number of uh, decisions based on his striking ability as well. He has excellent kicks. He will he'll go up and down the body, legs, body, head. He'll, he'll attack everywhere. Smooth combinations with his hands and lots of power behind everything he throws. Very fast with his strikes, good technique, very hard to defend against because he doesn't, he isn't lazy with his technique. Uh, this is his fourth fight at middleweight, so physically he should be fully adjusted at this point. It's still coming down from lightweight and he was a very heavy guy, kind of like Pat Barry, almost a very thick guy, especially with the legs, but he's, he's adjusted to the new weight class well and I think this will show up in this fight. Now Tavares, he has solid power as well, four wins by knockout. He, uh, he's outlanded his opponents in each of his last four fights, including topping Ricky Fukuda 116-69, to which is pretty impressive. He looked good, very good in that matchup on the feet. Good kicks, decent hands. He was much faster. Fukuda got off and avoided uh, Fukuda's return fire shots, which is very impressive as far as I was concerned. We saw him also score a win over a very good kickboxer in Tom Watson. He landed some good shots in that fight, but he needed the takedowns, and that was part of his game plan. And that fight was to land takedowns. He landed five on 12 attempts, and that really came down to probably one of the most decisive aspects of that match, even though he held his own on the feet with Watson. Other than Watson, though, Tavares, for the most part, has faced grapplers, guys like Aaron Simpson, Bubba McDaniels, Ricky Fukuda, and Dong Yi Yang. And Tavares, on average, has scored two takedowns per fight in his last five wins that went the distance. So he needs them to supplement his striking. But again, he's facing guys he should have a striking advantage over but he still needed to fall back on the wrestling. Larkin, 80% takedown defense, which is pretty impressive. In his debut, which he lost, which he was robbed in against Francis Carmont, he shut down nine of Carmont's 11 takedowns, and we just saw how good a wrestler Francis Carmont is, the way he destroyed Costa Filippo with his takedowns and won that fight quite handily. Larkin, nine of 11. And even when he did get taken down, he got up very quickly. Uh, he showed excellent balance, balancing on one leg and using the cage to stay up, and it was very impressive. Now, Tavares, for my money, is not nearly as good a grappler as Francis Carmont. We saw him have some trouble maintaining control over, uh, over uh, oh, uh, Kong Watson when the fights went to the mat, and that's something that he will be in he'll need to do against Lorenz Larkin if he's going to take this fight. Larkin for me is the more technical striker. He hits harder and should have a speed advantage over Tavares as well. Brad, he needs to outstrike him because for me, I don't think the takedowns are going to be there and that's, at least with consistency, he might get him down once or twice, but Larkin will spring right back up. Tavares has been in some close striking based contests with far lesser strikers than Lorenz Larkin. And again, he needed those wrestling takedowns to, to eke out the victories. He didn't look as sharp against Bubba McDaniels. He was a bit tentative to exchange. I think when Lorenz Larkin starts landing, he he put a beating on Chris Camozzi, and Camozzi's a tough customer, and Larkin really took it to him, and his aggressive style, he needs to be careful not to get clipped with a big shot, because, you know, Robbie Lawler did dummy leg him, but again, Lawler's a pretty tough guy, if he lands a big shot, he could hurt anybody, either way, I think Lorenz Larkin will outstrike Brad Tavares, my prediction is Lorenz Larkin to defeat uh, Brad Tavares, I'll take Larkin by decision. Main event prediction time. We're continuing the UFC's middleweight division. I like how they did this. They had two very good middleweight matchups on the main card, meaning if one of these guys in the main event dropped out, they could have put Larkin in against Rockhold or Tavares up in a position like this and still had a pretty decent main event in the proper weight class. Uh, but in this fight, we have the former Strike Force middleweight champion, number six ranked Luke Rockhold with a record of 10-2-0, battling the number 10 ranked Costa Filippo with a record of 12-3-0 with one no contest. Uh, now, Rockhold's coming off a very deflating UFC debut where he was defeated by Vitor Belfort. He lasted just 2 minutes and 32 seconds in the cage, and now he's on an 8-month layoff. So he came with a lot of hype, and it was shut down immediately by Vitor, who's a buzzsaw right now. It snapped his night fight winning streak, which all came in strike force, leading to his eventual title win and a, and a defense or two in there against Tim Kennedy and uh, Keith Jardine, the long-forgotten or not forgotten Keith Jardine. Uh, Costa, five uh, fight winning streak snapped in his last fight in a one-sided performance against Francis Carmont, which is very disappointing. Uh, he had been riding his ability to keep fights vertical and use his striking. And for the most part, Costa's primarily a boxer with decent power and good technique, and that's where he needs to keep fights vertical and use that striking technique. He has six wins by knockout, two in the UFC. He stopped Jared Hamm with some brutal shots, and he eventually stopped Tim Boach in a fight that I want to talk about a little bit later on. It fits better in my uh, breakdown in a moment or two. Uh, Costa throws good combinations, lots of lateral movement in and out, brutal uppercut, not a ton of kicks, and he will counter strike as well, and he's a very effective striker when he can work a striking game. Now, Rockhold, he's a very decent kickboxer. He will work kicks extremely well, especially to the body and the legs. For my money, he's the more diverse striker when compared to Costa Filippo. The question is, will he be, ten be able to land those strikes with consistency? 
Now the former Strike Force champ is going to have a four inch reach and four inch height advantage, which he needs to exploit and magnify with his kicks. Really keep Costa on the outside, out of boxing range, keep him in kicking range. Uh, statistics advantage for Rockhold big time. Strikes landed per minute 3.33 versus 2.39, so almost one strike per minute more, which will show up in a five round fight if it does go that long. But more importantly, strikes absorbed per minute. Rockhold holds his opponents to 1.69 strikes per minute compared to 2.45 for Costa. So you compare those numbers. If this fight goes long, that's going to show up for big, big time for Luke Rockhold. He needs to mix up his striking, which is very important, but he needs to avoid getting too aggressive and forgetting his defensive work, which can lead to some problems. We saw, of course, Belfort caught him with a head kick and eventually finished him on the mat. And Jacques Array landed some decent shots in their title fight and scored a couple of knockdowns against Rockwell because he got overzealous and got too aggressive and left himself out to be exposed. Now, uh, looking here, Costa overall has... When you look at the grappling, Costa's shown some very good takedown defense, like we mentioned before. He uses underhooks very effectively, he has a good sprawl, he knows how to use that cage. And overall, he's a very physically strong guy, and he can, as long as he can match up with you and get those underhooks established, he can keep fights vertical with a relative ease. Now, he has a grappling background, formerly trained with the Sarah Longo group alongside middleweight champion Chris Wyman, but he left them last fight, so maybe he's not getting that grappling, and it certainly showed up grappling you know, work, and it certainly showed up in his last fight. He's a BJJ Purple Belt overall, just one win by submission. He averages 0.5 takedowns per fight. We did see him land two against Jorge Rivera earlier in his career, and one against Jared Hammond, who was in rough trouble in that fight. But that's it overall. For the most part, Costa wants to avoid the ground, and that's I can't blame him for that because his hands are so good. 73% takedown defense in four fights prior to the Tim Boach matchup. His opponents were 1 for 17 on takedown attempts. But Tim Boach went 2 for 8 in that fight. He went 2 for 2 in the first round with relative ease, putting Costa on his back. The 0 for 6 part came when he started suffering those injuries and really slowed down. Uh, in that matchup and eventually was defeated. I think it was a headbutt and a couple other things that really cost him. Now, Boach, for me, showed some cracks in Costa's takedown defense, and Francis Carmont went 5-for-5, five five, which was very impressive. He put him down with relative ease, and he kept him down. Costa had relatively nothing to offer off his back, which was a major concern against guys who can put him on his back. They, they see that now. Rockhold, has seen, as I said, he's seen all this. He's a decent wrestler in his own right. Uh, his stats don't show up, but he's a BJJ black belt. He does have six wins by submission, six of his ten wins by submission. He's a BJJ competitor, very capable there. And AKA, working AKA, he's going to be drilling his wrestling coming into this matchup. The threat of the takedown needs to be established early by Rockhold. The slow cost is forward push down. Rockhold, he has been KO'd twice. So he needs to be very careful. He doesn't get caught with a big shot from Philippou. Uh, but for my money, again, I keep saying that for my money, but it is. Because, and it's for your money too. Costa's going to be the more diverse striker. He's going to, sorry, Rockhold will be the more diverse striker. He'll throw the higher output, and that grappling advantage shows up big. He could choose to go 100% grappling in this fight, look for takedowns, and really ground uh, Costa through it and take his boxing right out of this matchup. Over a five round fight, the cardio should also favor Rockhold. I would expect his Costa will slow down. Costa was losing that Boach fight prior to the injuries, and he looked horrid against Francis Carmot. I think Luke Rockhold explo exploits that, and my prediction is Luke Rockhold to defeat Costa Philippou. I'll take Rockhold by decision. So those are my six main card predictions for the UFC Fight Night 35 event, which takes place on a Wednesday night. Keep that in mind. The bet packs will be for sale. Josh Harper will have his predictions. The panel will have their predictions. So please check us out at kamikazeoverdrive.net for my preliminary predictions as well. We have all kinds of betting information. And I'm posting the betting lines there as well. You can vote in the public picks and let's see who everyone else is picking as far as the public. And it's just, again, I'm doing as much as I possibly can to make sure you get the full gamut of uh, predictions uh, information. Uh, that I can provide and give you that edge. I'm not going to be right all the time. We've seen that more than on one, more than one occasion, but I'm doing my best. And I always try and provide uh, solid information for both guys. And I give you my opinion, but I certainly don't feel, for example, Costa Phillip, who could very well walk away at the fight from Luke Rockhold and take that matchup. But I feel Rockhold has the best chance of the two based on what we've seen so far. Nonetheless, I appreciate all the comments. Thank you for tuning in and listening to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions.